Nikki Haley and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin this hour. So does this look like someone who doesn't have it all together? Welcome, everyone. I'm Charles Payne in for Neil Cavuto, and this is your world. The president also touting the media coverage of his bipartisan immigration meeting. We're going to have more on that in a moment as well. But first, John Roberts at the White House with the latest. John. And uh, the news that was made this afternoon, Charles, uh, came on a couple of fronts. First of all, on the Russia investigation, uh, we learned earlier this week that President Trump's legal team believes that the special counsel, Robert Mueller, will at some point in the next few weeks ask for some sort of an interview uh, with the president, uh, whether it's a lengthy interview like Hillary Clinton did in July of 2016, or whether it's a quick deposition or maybe a set of written answers to submitted questions, we don't yet know. But the negotiations are ongoing as to what form and forum uh, that might take. So I asked the president about it very specifically today. Uh, would he sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller? Uh, would he do it without precondition, or would he want a defined set of parameters? Now, let's look at the evolution of the president's position over the last few months. Initially asked about it about six months ago, he said yes, he'd gladly sit down with Robert Mueller. Asked about it at Camp David over the weekend, he said yeah, but there's no collusion, there's no crime. Watch what transpired when I asked him about that today. I've been in office now for 11 months. For 11 months, they've had this phony cloud over this administration, over our government. And it has hurt our government. It does hurt our government. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. But it has been determined that there is no collusion, and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. Would you, would you be open to it? We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion, and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. So that is the latest step in the evolution. The president now saying, after saying yes and yeah, that he would sit down with Robert Mueller. I don't see any reason why there should be an interview because there's no evidence of collusion. Another piece of news was made on uh, getting a DACA fix and some border security. Of course, yesterday, the president had that big, open, televised, freewheeling meeting with 22 members of Congress on the Republican and Democratic side from the Senate and the House, uh, after which uh, people weren't exactly clear whether or not the president would insist that a wall uh, would have to be built as part of a DACA fix. The president saying in that meeting that my position will be whatever they decide here, and not just in this room, but whatever Congress decides, that'll be my position. So the president was asked today, well, if Congress comes to a decision where there's a DACA fix without a wall, would that be satisfactory to you? Listen here. Got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Uh, I would imagine that the people in the room, both Democrat and Republican, uh, I really believe they're going to come up with a solution to the DACA problem, which has been going on for a long time, and maybe beyond that immigration as a whole. But any solution has to include the wall, because without the wall, it all doesn't work. So the president definitively saying there, Charles, that the wall has to be part of a DACA fix, which likely means he's going to run into problems with the Democrats on Capitol Hill. Charles? John Roberts, thank you very much. The president today also taking aim at the media's coverage of yesterday's bipartisan meeting on immigration. Here's what the president had to say. It was a tremendous meeting. Actually, it was reported as incredibly good. And my performance, if, you know, some of them called it a performance. I consider it work. But got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. <laughs> then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed. So is it painting some of the members of the media to say anything positive about this president? Let's ask Democratic strategist Richard Goodstein, Denise Borelli with the Conservative Review, and Kelly Jane Torrance with the Weekly Standard. Kelly Jane, I want to start with you because <laughs> I saw a lot of people, a lot of Never Trumpers, a lot of reporters who have been pushing back on his administration from day one actually applaud him in the way that meeting was handled. 
Yeah, I have to say, Charles, I'm someone who you know was not necessarily a big fan of uh, candidate Trump, but I think that you should call them as you see him. And if he does something great, you should you know make a point of pointing that out and saying, hey, this is great. Let's let's see more of that. And if he does something bad, though, you also should be saying, hey, this is this is bad. You you need to be honest, I think, and not be a partisan. And I do have to wonder, though, you know, when Donald Trump calls the mainstream media fake news and says they're not to be believed, then should we believe them as well when they give him good reviews? You know, when he was complaining about the Michael Wolff book, he actually used some quotations from places like CNN and, and NBC, like places he does not like that he calls fake news, and he was using that to attack Wolff's book. So I do kind of wonder if the president can have it both ways here. Well, I don't know that he's having it both ways, Denine. I mean, the, the media has been pretty harsh on President Trump uh, from the very beginning. And to his point, uh, the knee-jerk reaction is, hey, you know what, this little a bit of ray of sun Shine, a little bit of honesty because it was it was an amazing meeting and everyone had to admit that much but by the late afternoon yesterday the negativity started coming back yeah the liberal media just can't help themselves I mean talk about transparency no he said she said I think the president was in full control with the conversation yesterday and when you think about the history of the media the liberal media that has had it in for Donald Trump when he was running and they still have it in for President Trump now the man can't do anything right. What the media does not want to talk about are the accomplishments that are coming out of this administration. Job growth, the economy is booming, uh, the wages are increasing, people are getting bonuses that they've never gotten before. That's what the media doesn't want to cover. Richard, when, when, you, when the Democrats take the resist oath, is part of it, <laughs> is part of the oath never admit anything good with President Trump? I give President Trump um, credit for opening this meeting, presumably to show that he didn't suffer from any kind of mental incapacity. But what he did show was he didn't know what he was talking about. And I say that not, let me just read one sentence. This is him, quote, I think a clean DACA bill to me is a DACA bill, but we take care of 800,000 people. But I think to me, a clean bill is a bill of DACA. We take care of them and we also take care of security. So I guarantee that's Richard, why Kevin honest. McCarthy had to stand up and say, I object, no, no, Mr. President. Nick couldn't even stand still. I, I, think, I think you're being somewhat unfair here. President Trump, we know, has this sort of stream of consciousness, right? So he's thinking and talking out loud, and he's trying to reach across the aisle. Here you have a, a meeting and that the whole world gets to watch 55 minutes uh, with people on the, both sides of the aisle pushing back against the president, and he's allowing this. This is something Americans are not accustomed to. He's sitting next to critics, and he's allowing them to voice their opposition, and he's trying to knit together something in the midst of all of that. And I mean, and, and so, you know, you offer backhanded compliments and, and, a, and a critique that it's easier to do 24 hours later. No, th look, there is not a soul, Charles, who could tell you with certainty whether he insists on a clean DACA or doesn't, whether he wants a wall or is prepared to deal without it. We've heard later what he said. The fact that they had to take out of the written comments that the actual transcript had to delete his endorsement of a clean DACA bill tells you they have unclean hands, that even the White House staff doesn't trust him to say anything because he doesn't make sense. And I will just point to what he just said about Russia. The intelligence community has said from the start that the Russians interfered, and he still, a year later, won't right. accept let me, that. Let me, so, let me bring in Deneen real quick on this, because here's the thing, Deneen, uh, and I think Richard is actually uh, underscoring, I think, why President Trump is so has this adversarial relationship with uh, his detractors, particularly in the media. Uh, you know, it was a great, it was a great meeting. Uh, if you critique it for every little nuance of it, uh, then you can find fault with almost anything. Sure. Perhaps the Gettysburg Address. Uh, you know, so in this particular instance, though, again, setting the tone, setting the stage. Uh, the main thrust of this segment we're saying is that this was a moment that people embraced initially, uh, critics of President Trump and the media, only to later to start to find fault with it. And they, were, they will continue to do so. It was nearly an hour meeting. And anyone could sit and watch the meeting. It's online. Anyone can see what was discussed, what was going on. But you're going to continue to have those on the left, like Richard and the, the main liberal mainstream media, continue to attack the president's mental capacity. Joy Behar said he should be drugged and put in a hospital. I mean, these comments are outrageous against this president. But Americans see past it. Over 60% of Americans believe the, the the mainstream media is an enemy of right. the president. Right. It's all negative. All right, guys. Uh, thank you all very much. Meanwhile, the president.
cabinet meeting with U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley as we speak. South Korea just giving him a big thumbs up on his handling of the new crisis. But what is North Korea really up to? We're all over that. And new worries over the nation's mounting debt with China threatening to stop buying it. So is this time for Republicans to be talking about bringing back pork barrel spending? One of the Republicans who may be leading the charge is here. January 20th, Cofundo is live for two hours from the nation's capital. One year after the inauguration, Neil breaks down the president's accomplishments, agenda, and how it all impacts you. Starting January 20th, don't miss Cofundo live every Saturday on the Fox News Channel. President Trump meeting with U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley right now. The administration just releasing a statement condemning the treatment of anti-government protesters in Iran. Blake Berman is at the White House with the latest. Blake. Hi there, Charles. On that meeting between President Trump and the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, scheduled to take place at any moment now here at the White House inside the Oval Office, as there are a host of international issues on this administrator's on this administration's plate, rather. Among them, the recent protests that we've seen in Iran in the past week or so, as some 4,000 Iranians, nearly that amount, have been arrested by the regime there. In a statement that was produced by the White House just a little while ago, they had this warning for that country's leader. Saying, quote, we will not remain silent as the Iranian dictatorship represses the basic rights of its citizens and will hold Iran's leaders accountable for any violations. The statement goes on to say the United States calls for the immediate release of all political prisoners in Iran, including the victims of the most recent crackdown. And then, of course, there is the issue of North Korea. Here at the White House a little while ago, there was a press conference with the president and the prime minister of Norway. A reporter from Norway asked the president, generally speaking, whether or not there is a war coming on the horizon. And the president shot down that suggestion. I don't expect that. I think we're going to have, uh, because of strength, peace through strength. I think we're going to have a long period of peace. I hope we do. You know, we have certainly problems with North Korea, but a lot of good talks are going on right now. As for those talks, the North Koreans have taken some diplomatic baby steps in the recent days, sitting down and talking with South Korea while also announcing they will send a contingent to the upcoming Winter Olympics next month in South Korea. The South Korean prime minister at a news conference earlier today seemed to credit President Trump, saying, and I quote, I think President Trump deserves big credit for bringing about the inner Korean talks. It could be a resulting work of U.S.-led sanctions and pressure. Charles. Blake, thank you very much. General Jack Keane with me now. First to Iran, where uh, they've extended sanctions relief. Uh, is this the right move uh, or, or, or a wrong move? Well, I think it's the right move if we believe what the president is being told, that there seems to be some consensus being developed in the Congress to go ahead and fix the nuclear deal. And if that's, that's the case, and we can fix the nuclear deal, particularly get rid of the sunset clauses, which permits Iran to move to a nuclear threshold capability in 10 years and in 15 years actually have a weapon, and put in some very ver verifiable inspection regime, then, then we have something. But is this what, what you were expecting? Because it felt like the, there was a tougher saber rattling leading up to this announcement today. Uh, and, and were we with respect to the deal that President Obama cut with, the, I guess, the six other nations or five other nations in Europe? Yeah, but I think, you know, what, what's happened, Charles, we're, go, we're in the third year of the Obama nuclear deal, so to speak. And what have we got for that? Remember, they were supposed to join the responsible nations in the region and, and change their malign behavior. They've increased their malign behavior. Right. They're running so, the so, war in so Syria. So uh, have we emboldened that further? I mean, uh, will additional sanctions send the message that we need to send to, hey, you've got to stop exporting terror you know, and, 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 and other things, and also the countdown to them eventually have a, nu a nuclear weapon? That, was today's decision strong enough? Well, I'm not sure we've got a decision yet. I think okay. what, what, what we are heading towards is a decision that's likely to certify the fact that Iran is still in compliance. But the president can issue sanctions not associated with the nuclear deal. One, for their malign behavior in the region. Two, for repressing their own people. And number three, for building ballistic missiles. He can still do that.
the shift to the North Korea uh, uh, this year has come in with a lot of more, a lot more optimism about diplomacy winning over. North Korea is going to field uh, some Olympic athletes. South Korea is saying they're coming to the table. They've exchanged uh, their their conversation. South Korea's president giving President Trump a lot of credit for that. Is there a diplomatic solution? I don't know, to be honest with you. But listen, certainly some negotiations here they're feeble at best. Likely gets North Korea some goodwill, also buys them some more time. They've certainly always wanted to drive a wedge between South Korea and the United States. That's probably what they're up to. But I also believe that some of the economic sanctions are taking some impact on North Korea. There's certainly the sanctions that have been imposed on North Korea, they've never had to face before. They've never worked before. But I think they're having some. But haven't impact. they been in a position where their citizens starved? Millions of them starved. I mean, Kim Jong Un is never going to starve, right? You've, in the meantime, you've got border guards with parasites. So uh, again, can we effectively cripple their economy enough to where they blink and give up their nuclear ambitions? I honestly don't know that, but I do know this: he doesn't care about his citizens who are suffering from malnutrition, to be sure. But he cares about the money that he gets from trade deals. And he cares about the oil that he needs to sustain his country. Right. And those things are being shut down. I don't know if the diplomatic option is, is really out there, but it's, it's certainly worth exploring, given the, the alternative is either we accept North Korea having nuclear weapons and we go to a, de a deterrent strategy and containment, or we're going to start pulling triggers. Right, and I think we all agree, peace through strength. Maybe we will get a Pax Americana. Who knows? General Jack Kane. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good talking to you, Charles. The president calling for a, quote, bill of love for dreamers. But remember what he said when this guy called illegal immigration an act of love. And later, a super showdown after NBC says it will be showing any anthem protests during the Super Bowl. Justified or just a ploy for more ratings? Well, one day after that bipartisan meeting with President Trump, Virginia Congressman Bob Goodlatte unveiling an immigration bill to address DACA and border security. This comes as lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are meeting to find a path forward on immigration reform. Mike Emanuel has the latest from our nation's capital. Mike. Charles, good afternoon to you. There are all kinds of meetings on immigration reform going on here on Capitol Hill. As you mentioned, some key House Republicans rolled out their own immigration reform plan a short time ago. This bill provides DACA recipients a reasonable, long-term legislative solution. This legislation includes strong anti-fraud measures and ensures that DACA recipients don't get a special pathway to citizenship. We're giving them the opportunity to every, you know, three years have uh, for, for eternity legal status here uh, to be able to work, go to school, travel. Uh, and take the existing paths that we have in our system to citizenship, but not go ahead of anybody else. The immediate priority for Democrats is the so-called dreamers, young people who were brought to this country illegally by their parents. President Trump set a March deadline for Congress to address that problem, but Democrats are trying to force a deal now. Who among us would deny for one second that the people who have made America great are those who came from other lands? They were not here. We all came from another land. And we have made America better. There was also a bipartisan immigration meeting on the Senate side this afternoon. Democrats Dick Durbin and Michael Bennett, and Republicans Lindsey Graham, Jeff Flake, and Cory Gardner. So while all these discussions are taking a place about legislative options dealing with immigration reform, there's also aggressive enforcement taking place. A DHS and ICE officers visiting 7 Eleven stores all across the country to make sure their employees have the right paperwork. Charles? Mike, thank you very much. President Trump calling for a, quote, bill of law for dreamers during yesterday's bipartisan meeting. Take a listen. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush tweeting, he's encouraged by all the efforts, but does anyone remember when the president said uh, during the 2016 campaign after Bush called illegal immigration an act of love? The weakest person on this stage by far on illegal immigration is Jeb Bush. They come out of an act of love, whether you like it or not. He is so weak. 
on illegal immigration. I'm Jeb on the Reagan said side of this. That they come into our country as an act of love. With all of the problems that we have in so many instances, we have wonderful people coming in. But with all of the problems, this is not an act of love. So is President Trump changing his position? Joining me now, Democratic strategist Christy Setzer, Fox News News contributor Steve Cortez, and GOP strategist Ford O'Connell. Steve, let me start with you. Uh, this was sort of a contentious uh, area for you throughout the campaign. You sure. and I talked about it a lot personally and also on the air. Where do you see President Trump now, and has he changed his position? You know, Charles, I don't think he's changed his position. Because, by the way, adults choosing to break our immigration law, is that enough to love? No. Uh, and, by the way, I don't call them undocumented. Uh, if, if you come into my home uninvited, you're not undocumented. You are a burglar. Uh, however, when we talk about DACA, we're talking about people who are brought here by no choice of their own, who were brought here of, of ch as children, many of whom have lived there practically their entire lives. So when the president says, now, today, that that's an act of love. What he means is that we're going to show great compassion to people who have largely lived American lives who didn't choose to break our immigration laws. Yeah, by the same token, Christy, what people are afraid of, a lot of Americans are, are that uh, if, you, if you do this, you'll con continue to encourage illegal immigration. And that's where the fine line comes, uh, that, hey, if someone's lived here for a long time and they're a student, they work, they've contributed, that's one thing. But how do you stop the red carpet and how do you curtail tell illegal immigration because we do have a right to protect our borders, right? Uh, of course, and we do have stringent um, border protection, and that is uh, why during the Obama administration, you actually saw net negative immigration. You saw actually fewer people leave, more people leave the country than actually came into it. To go back to whether Trump has changed his position, quite obviously he has. He said literally the opposite of what he said during the campaign. I did Christy, not hear, let, a, lot hey, of I did not hear a lot of compassion let, for let me cut uh, to the people who are coming here. into our country Christy, during let, let me cut the, to the campaign. Chase on this point. The rapists, Democrats, the hold on one second, hold on one second, one at a time. All right, uh, Ford, come, you come in. Yeah, look, Democrats don't want to solve this problem. No, I do not believe that Trump has changed his tune, but I do think that there is a fear on the right, as evidenced by Tucker Carlson and Ann Coulter, that, that Trump might actually get rolled by the status quo. Look, Trump should do a deal on DACA, but he should only do a deal if he gets border, you know, funding for the wall, Amen. in chain in chain migration, and we can end the visa lottery program. Understand something, Joe. The biggest threat we have, even more so than the wall, is chain migration, because if I let 700,000 DACA recipients come in, under our current legal status, they could bring in 10 million people. I mean, we're not just talking about spouses and children. We're talking yeah. about an entire village. We need an immigration right. system that serves so, a national Ford, interest. Christy? Ford, the biggest danger is, is none of the things that you talked about. The biggest danger is that the leader of your party has no idea what he's talking about on this issue. And that was pretty clear yesterday in the meeting, the televised immigration yeah, meeting that was supposed that, to show how confident uh, he is when he didn't know what a clean DACA bill no, was. No, 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 see, I totally clean, disagree with you, Christy. A clean so, DACA bill, it's, it's, up to the, it's up to the person who's, who, let's not go back there. I, you know, I was hoping that we would be over that. that you know, we're talking I, about, Steve, we're we're, Steve, we're talking about the idea, whatever President Trump thinks is a clean DACA bill could be different than what you think is a clean DACA of bill. Course. That's why they were in that room. That, <laughs> that's why they're in the okay. room negotiating. I think, a lot of Americans would like a, I think a lot of Americans would like Charles. to see a clean start with this, where something where we never get in this pickle again, because Ford was right. A lot of folks on the right are extremely upset with President Trump, in part because sure. Ronald Reagan negotiated in good faith and he was rolled. Right. No, and listen, I think it was one of the massive uh, failures, actually, of, of, of one of the few, thankfully, of the Reagan administration was what he did with amnesty. Uh, I would say this, I think, and I would try to caution people on Team Trump who are upset with the president. Uh, believe in him. If we show compassion toward DACA, but we, are, we can show heart there and we can show toughness everywhere else in terms of end the visa lottery, uh, at least severely restrict, if not end, chain migration, control the border, which we've already done a lot of, by the way. A lot Steve, of that hard Steve, work. If we I do all of that in one grand deal, then we are going to, by the way, not only do great work for the American people, but we are right. also going to win Steve, the Hispanic vote in 2020. Steve, I guarantee I, that. I, I, I'm, I'm as loyal as they come to President <laughs> Trump. Let me make the following point. I'm not worried about President Trump. I'm worried about the status quo in Washington, particularly in Congress. Sure. And what we have to remember is the negative effects of illegal immigration and our cockeyed legal immigration. It's depressing wages. It's
costing jobs. It's $130 billion each right. year for illegal we, immigration. We have to fix which that. Is why we have to fix all that. But CBO, so chain migration. Which is why CBO just put out a score, oh, and it is very, very expensive, uh, the, the yeah, program but, we have now. Christy, Steve, Ford, thank you all very much for your passion. Thank appreciate you, Charles. It. Thank you. Well, first, they, there were the fires. Now, tragedy striking California again. This in the way of deadly mudslides. A frantic search is on now for people who have gone missing in all of this. We'll have the latest. First, the wildflower fires and now rescuers are underway in Southern California as waist high mud and floods sweep through homes and businesses. The death toll climbing to 15 today. Fox News correspondent William Lajeunesse is there with the latest. William. Well, Charles, 100 homes destroyed, 300 damaged. We just came from that Montecito neighborhood where they're cleaning up the power lines to here over to the 101. Now, this morning, this was a river of mud, and they've been bringing out soil all day long, truck after truck. 15 fatalities, as you mentioned. The sheriff says it could go higher because so many are unaccounted for. The mudslide, of course, did not begin here. It began in the higher slopes in the Santa Inez Mountains, where... The fire, the Thomas fire, stripped the hillsides of vegetation, turning the soil into powder. And when the rains came, so did the mud. There were just a few people who didn't listen to the fire department when they told us to take every car off the street. So those few people, their cars were like annihilated. The power line was coming down, the cars were coming down, rolling. You could hear the boulders rolling down the hill, you could hear the mud. I mean, it just it sounded like a freight train. So unlike a fire, which you can see and hear coming and you actually smell, a mudslide well, that arrives without a warning. That's one reason the fatality count is so high. The other one is many individuals did not, or they ignored rather, the evacuation order. And Charles, that is the controversy going forward. About 7,000 people had a mandatory evacuation, about 20,000 voluntary. Unfortunately, where the damage was was further downstream. And so that's the controversy going forward. Of course, it's impossible to predict where a mudslide is going to occur. Back to you. William, thank you very, very much. And now to a, a nationwide crisis. Hospitals are left scrambling during flu season after Hurricane Maria left a shortage of IV bags. Fox News correspondent Matt Finn with more on this. Matt. Charles, the saline bag shortage is so urgent. Some hospitals and clinics are being forced to decide who will get the limited number of bags they have. Steven, does it matter? Being a level one trauma center, a, a shortage of saline is dire. It's the very first thing that we give to the patients when they come in um, from a gunshot or a motor vehicle accident. They've had a loss of blood and we immediately have to bulk it back up and give them the fluids. The majority of America's saline manufacturing plants are in Puerto Rico and were knocked off the power grid by Hurricane Maria. It's caused a nationwide shortage of saline bags. It might not sound like that big of a deal, but medical professionals say saline is one of the first things they reach for to save lives. The shortage means medical professionals and nurses have to spend critical time, up to 30 minutes or more, manually injecting the fluids. And some patients who get routine injections or infusions are forced to receive treatment without the very important saline. I've had even friends and family members say, what's the big deal? It's, you know, it's, just, it's saline, it's, you know, but they don't realize unless you live it, you need it, you know, that's gonna help you from being so nauseous or having a reaction or having terrible headaches. Now, one of America's largest manufacturers of saline bags, Baxter, says its three plants in Puerto Rico are back online, but it could be some time before production is fully restored. And, Charles, we spoke to one clinic in California. It says it has enough saline to get to February, and then after that, who knows? Charles? And thank you very, very much. Uh, to a big topic in D.C. right now, if President Trump really wants to bring back air marks, he'll need this guy to do it. Republican Congressman Pete Sessions, the big question, is he on board? He's next. Interest rates spiking on a report China may stop buying our debt. The yield on the 10-year Treasury note nearing 2.6 percent. Now, that's the highest level in about 10 months. Fox Business Network's Charlie Gasparino and what's got folks worried. Charlie, we're, all of a sudden, yields are spiking. Yeah, I mean, listen, this isn't the end of the world, um, and it's not like they're a huge buyer right now. They're a, a massive holder 
of our debt, but I think they've, they're no longer the top buyer of our debt anymore. You know, here's where this thing could get a little problematic, uh, Charles. Um, let's just say that Trump, uh, President Trump engages in some sort of a trade war with China or, you know, uh, more protectionism, starts screwing with them. They could screw with us back. And here's how they can really screw with us back is essentially unload our treasury bonds. And when you do that, when you sell something, right, the price goes down and guess what? The yield of a bond goes up. Those yields are attached to mortgages, to credit cards, and things of that nature, and that's where it could get problematic. I think the threat itself is, is you know, just thrown out there, but if they really do something concerted, like a massive sale of treasuries, uh, you know, you're going to have higher interest rates, you're going to have the stock market go down, and you could have a, a recession. I mean, it's just, that's the way the economy works. We, as the government, don't control interest rates. We control a little bit on the short term. Sure. The Fed raises and, and lowers the Fed funds rate, but long-term rates are controlled by investors. And guess what? China is a very, very big investor in, in our treasuries. But, but real quick, though, Charlie, by the same token, uh, the, we have a massive trade deficit with them. We could also elect not to buy a whole bunch of cheap plastic products from China for about six or seven months. And that might be more painful to them than our uh, short-term blip in interest rates to us. Well, they well then they'll stop buying our agricultural products. I think one of the reasons why uh, um, uh, President Trump has backed off of some of this chi China stuff is because he knows from the agricultural industry, the farmers, that they need China, or the open market of China, to sell their stuff to. So this this goes both ways, and they have a lot of they have a lot of cards in their hand. All right, Charlie Gasparino, thank you very much. So with more worries about debt, critics say. This is certainly no time to bring back earmarks. The president wants earmarks back to you. No, I'm, I'm not a big fan of earmarks. I think that, you know, our constitutional responsibility should lie with the entire $1.1 trillion that we're about to uh, appropriate, not just a few small dollars. It's normally a way to provide leverage and increase spending. I don't know that it's something that I can support. So what does our next guest make of all of this? House Rules Chairman Pete Sessions joins me now. Uh, sir, thank you very much. I, I was shocked, and I think a lot of our viewers were, that Republicans are leading the way with this, that they're, they're, they're whispering sweet nothings in the air of the president. Hey, earmarks could help us. We thought we were rid of those. Well, in fact, we will continue to be rid of those. Uh, as you might remember, back in 2009, Mrs. Clinton uh, put in some $500 million worth of earmarks by walking into the, uh, the appropriations packages and putting stickies on them. That was why in, later in 2010, Speaker Boehner put a moratorium on that process, and the Senate has done the same. But the bottom line is we have not fixed the process. And the process is going to take place next Wednesday and Thursday at the Rules Committee where we will hear testimony. The effort that we're after is to create a circumstance where an administration, as we know Barack Obama's administration, had between five and fifteen billion dollars a year to use the spending as they saw it should take place. And it was sole many of it was sole right. source and their own decision. So we're going to come up with a moving forward process that will be transparent and meritorious based. This is why we're going to take feedback from all sorts of members and, and group outside groups. And we intend to move forward with a plan that will be fair and equitable, but will not reside right. well, on, 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 on earmarks. It will be based upon votes in the House and the success of the needs of the nation proponents, including Republicans who have all of a sudden jumped back on the bandwagon, are saying that there are good things with this, that you can actually get things done, uh, that, that the bureau bureaucrats won't be in control, that uh, this is why you don't have any sort of bipartisanship anymore, that this is glue that can knit it together, and that, by the way, they also say that the numbers aren't that much in the grand scheme of things, $5 billion here or $15 billion there. That's right. The, the numbers are small. But the bottom line is, is that today we as members of Congress cannot give any feedback about any sort of measure, any sort of project that the state or that that district may have. And it will allow us to make sure we have to put our name there. And I believe the process would be one that would say it will be decided 
here in the in where we appropriate money, not somewhere where we have to go fight and dig to find out and get information. And that's what we had to do with Solyndra. As you'll recall, that administration had between five and fifteen billion dollars a year and they right. made their own decisions. Oh, by the way, they're the ones that went and gave money out on a partisan basis. I don't think that's good for anybody. And the American people know this. They do. Representative Sessions, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You bet. So if you're still watching football games, you probably notice it's been a while since the network showed players kneeling. So why is NBC going to show it during the Super Bowl? Is that the right or wrong move? An NBC executive producer vowing to show any player kneeling for the national anthem during the Super Bowl. So the question is, is this just a ploy to increase ratings? Here with the latest Fox News correspondent, Trace Gallagher. Hey, Charles, you know, for context, the NFL has 1,696 players during the last game of the regular season. 19 of them either knelt during the national anthem or stayed in the locker room. So the number of players protesting is dropping. But the executive producer of NBC Sports, Fred Goodelli, says if the players kneel during the Super Bowl, the cameras will roll. Quote, when you're covering a live event, you're covering what's happening. So if there are players that choose to kneel, they will be shown live. Gadelli went on to say that game announcers Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth would ID the players who kneel and explain the backstory of the protest. Last year, 12, like 112 million people watched the Super Bowl. This year, it's expected to be around the same, though we should note NFL ratings have taken a hit all year long. For the regular season, ratings were down almost 10 percent, and for the first wild card games last weekend, they were down 11 and a half percent. Fred Goodelli says there are lots of reasons for the drop in ratings, like being able to watch games on different devices, cold weather, your team having a bad year, except a poll by J.D. Power says the national anthem protests are the number one reason that fans are watching fewer games. Charles. Thank you very much. So are we going to see a steady decline in ratings for NFL games? Here to debate with me is Internet Radio host Mike Gunzelman, U.S. News & World Report contributor Ashley Pratt, and Fox News contributor Jammu Green. Jammu, uh, the, the biggest stage ever for this protest, so what do you expect? Look, I, I think that we are going to continue to see this protest happening unless we actually have a conversation about it. And we have to remember that the ratings actually took a hit when Colin Kaepernick's supporters said that they were going to boycott the NFL games. So that was the first so protest. So you don't think these are people who are upset about the, 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 who support the military, who support the flag? I think it's everyone. I think it's people who are supporting, supporting Colin Kaepernick and people who are supporting Donald Trump's protests. And guess what? It's also people who are saying that when you know that 99 percent of NFL players who've had their brain tested after they passed away wow. have neurodegenerative wow. disease. This is all the violence of the sport, the protests, all of it. Well, Mike, the, the sport has been violent for a long time. That right. didn't just happen overnight. <laughs> and, and that's not going to stop future uh, kids from uh, being able to make millions of dollars and do this. Listen, there's a lot of reasons why the NFL well, is uh, falling as far as ratings go. I mean, first of all, the games have been absolutely atrocious this year. I mean, we all know the Jets are going to be terrible to begin the season with, but you have the Cleveland Browns going 0-16. They didn't <laughs> but, win one game. Hey, are you know you who's kidding? not? The Patriots <laughs> oh, there, Mike. I know oh, you love golly. the Patriots. But. You won't even start with them yet, actually. Yeah. They start every game with a seven-zip uh, advantage because of the refs, but that's a different hey, topic. Hey, hey. But, yeah. Mike, what about the idea, though, that the protests are playing into this uh, rapid decline of the NFL ratings? I mean, you, can, you cannot say that the protests do not have an effect on people chewing out from the games. I mean, I absolutely think they do. Also, the fact that a lot of these players that were protesting didn't even know what they were protesting for. How about this? How about Colin Kaepernick? The reason I don't agree with him is the fact that he had uh, cops depicted as pigs on his saw. Hey, all right, that that to me is like I don't agree with you, Colin Kaepernick, right there. A right. lot of them don't well, know what they were actually, even arguing. Let me for. bring you in because I think what a lot of folks are saying is you can have the conversation, and you can voice the opinion that you have with regard to whether it's police brutality or whatever. But why not have them before the game, after the game? Why specifically doesn't it have to be during the national anthem, which obviously offends a lot of Americans? 
So I think right now you've brought up two very like perfect storm scenarios. You've got a group of Americans who think that this is offensive to the military. Then we've seen some military members come out and say, I fought for their right to do this. So if they choose to kneel, they should kneel. So I agree with NBC's decision here. If this is what's happening in real time, show it. Now, do I think there should be a discussion around this on both sides of the, the spectrum? Yes, I think there should be a healthy right. debate. If these athletes want to use their platform and their, you know, professional careers to advocate for some of these things that they believe in, go for it. And I think that's what we should really be focusing on here is the issue of free speech and a free market. So if these executives want to make this decision, you although, know, fans, players, although, whoever can turn away from it I, and say, we don't support this. I will or we say did. that most people watching this show right now have restrictions on what they can and cannot say at work, even with the First Amendment. And it's not their platform, it's the NFL's platform. Are you worried that ultimately this can even hurt their earnings power and, and diminish the message they're trying to get through, Jermaine? Well, their earnings power as players are, is pretty strong right now. I, I'm and it's not... based on ratings, NFL ratings. and. Well, the, the reality is that we can't think that we're going to continue with a, some type of plantation mentality when it comes to... Someone may 